successful author, Toni Morrison, states the following. If there's a book you really want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. I think it would be fair to say that uh, others in the world of fine arts feel the same way. Hence, the personal touch in their respective art forms. And on today's program, we have such guests, and they're members of the International Black Writers and Artists of Los Angeles. We have so much to talk about, so you guys got to join us in our conversation right after this message. The mother of award shows is back. By my first name, and her name, first name is Francesca. <laughs> she said, my name is Zeal Harris. Welcome to the program. Thank you. A visual artist, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the program. Right next to you, we have uh, a young woman who I happen to know her father for many, many years, and I'm proud to say that now she's working for the Los Angeles Times, a journalist, Erin Aubrey Kaplan, who is now working as a columnist for the Los Angeles Times. Welcome to the program, my friend. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, you know what? It's Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is I want to hear from you two about the world of fine arts, about the world, the literary world. Today, your personal life, and maybe we'll even touch base on the, the Harlem Renaissance because it, it all started, well, it started way before then, but finally the white publisher said, you know what, maybe they got something to offer and we'll start publishing. That's when it all started from, mm -hmm. from the general public perspective. So we're going to talk about that later on in the program. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, the difficulties of uh, being an artist and being a writer, because you used to work for uh, another newspaper. Let's talk about that first, because if there are young people out here uh, that are watching the program, and they're going to say, wow, I have to go through that <laughs> to become a visual artist or to be a columnist, <laughs> Zeal, you're on. Ah, uh, um, I think maybe you should ask me a question. <laughs> well, well <laughs> so but tell me start. about your, how did you get started? How did you get started? <clears throat> Um, well, I did all kinds of things when I was young. I mean, you know, I, I made art when I was a kid. Two, I, three years old, five, <laughs> yeah, um, I guess maybe people in my community started recognizing that I was creative. And I say community because my grandmother had a, kind of like a small town cafe mm -hmm. in Virginia in a place called Phoebus, Virginia. And the community would come in and, you know, buy beer, fish dinners, fried chicken, you know, cigars. And they would sometimes bring me canvas or coloring books and crayons and paint and that kind of thing. And, you know, I would sit at a booth. How old were you? I was maybe five, six, seven. And teachers also said that I was pretty creative, so they encouraged me to be creative. And then when I was about um, 10, I guess, in fourth grade, there was a gifted and talented program. And through that program, I started taking art classes, which were more sophisticated in a sense mm -hmm. um, and rigorous than... Now, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. now, why did you like doing it? I mean, some people like to play soccer, baseball, basketball, uh, play an instrument. But why did you like to do it? Well, I did all kinds of things when I was a kid. So, I, I mean, I guess when I think back to my childhood, the main things that I did were sit around, talk to people, play games, climb trees, dig in the dirt, draw, and read. And that was it, basically, and that's how you got started. Yeah, that's how I got started. I mean, that's all part of your life at that time. Yeah. <laughs> what about... What about you? I, I know your father was a writer. You wrote for the L.A. Center. Well, my father will say he's not a writer. He, t he says my daughter's the writer. Oh, okay. But he does write. He's been a columnist for 20 years at the L.A. Center. Absolutely. But he's a, an activist, but that's a different thing. Right. Actually, my history is very much like Zeal's. Um, I'm from here, um, and I, ever since I was five or six, or maybe younger, I wanted to write. I think you have to be sort of possessed to want to do art or write. I don't know why. I just wanted to do it. And so I really had thoughts when I was little of becoming, growing up and becoming a poet sounded like a good idea <laughs> because my the first thing I, I just like to play with words like she liked to play in the dirt but did you know what trees. did you know what a poet was at that time did I know what yeah did you know who oh yeah well sure I read nursery rhymes oh, you know okay, I knew right, that right. poems had to rhyme and but but then I got into the whole idea of just playing with words making them rhyme making them come out you know putting them in rhythms and sort of just play I, I saw it all as sort of play it didn't it, it, it was fun and I was sort of good at it and people like Zeal, people rec started recognizing that, hey, you know, she has a talent for writing. Um, and, you know, my big thing was a trip to the library once a week. <laughs> that was back when we had li neighborhood libraries, right. you know, and they were all open. Right. And, uh, and also, this was, you know, I'm starting to feel really old now, but this was before the age of video and cable and all that. So I spent a lot of my time reading. And I will say to anyone who wants to write, you must read. Well, a television in your lives, was it, was it influential oh, sure. at all? was influential yeah, yeah i mean did, did you watch some some young people watch six to eight hours of tv every day well right you know we had seven people in the house we had one tv and you had to warm it up half an hour before you turned it on you had to hang a sock on the antenna so it just was not 
was not. I just can see that now with Larry. With Larry, honey, could you turn the TV on? Yeah. So we, you, everybody, you, so in my house, you had to fight for a space, the TV, like you had to fight for the bathroom rights, right? right? And it wasn't that, it just wasn't that big, it wasn't like a TV in every room, it wasn't right. as pervasive as it is, as it is now, and I had a lot of downtime where I wasn't doing any of that stuff, right. and so it was much more conducive to reading. So I read a lot, and my favorite writers were, you know, after I got past Mother Goose and all that, right. Charles Dickens, you know, I really just wow. wanted to write things <laughs> like that, and, and there were just people I admired that I wanted to be, and I think um, um, Louisa May Alcott was another one, you know, she wrote <laughs> Little Women, I wanted to write like that. I really wanted to, to, to write like that. Um, so it was, you know, that's how I, my desire so you, came okay, about. Well, okay, so now you're in high school and you're planning to go to college, but let's just say you're, you're a young adult now. Who were your mentors in, in terms of the field that you're in right now, Seal? When I was in high school? Yeah, or, or as a young adult, right out of high school. Um, right out, well, I went to college. So Which college did you go to? <clears throat> I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. So um, I What had, was your major? Uh, actually, technically, my major was theater technology with a minor in art. So I would say that definitely teachers were mentors in a sense um, when it came to art. I don't think I knew any professional artist. And, and when you looked at, when you went to exhibitions or you looked at art books, etc., anybody pop out and said, that's what I would like to do? Um... Uh, I can't really say that until recently, actually. Um, it was just something that kind of just came to me and I just did it and I was influenced by a lot and I wasn't really trying to strive to be like anyone. But to use a street jargon, I think that's cool because it really came out of you. You didn't have to look at people's works to say, that's what I want to do. It's because you wanted to do it. What about you? Well, you uh, know, when I was, when I was, uh, young, uh, I remember writing uh, in school that cause it was a day we had to we had to tell teacher what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I wrote down that I wanted to be Phyllis Wheatley because <laughs> Phyllis Wheatley was an African American poet, the only one I had ever heard of, who um, uh, she was um, uh, kind of a formalist poet, but that's what that's what I wanted that's what I wanted to be. Well, I also want. Do you to, remember any of her poems? You know something no? I I. <laughs> I couldn't repeat them to you, but they were very much in the, in the very much in the European style. Right. She was very much admired because she was an ex-slave who um, learned to do exactly what the British did, which was which was a big thing. Um, but she also uh, she also struggled with trying to find her own voice, which she wasn't really allowed to do. So I thought she was kind of tragic once I learned about her later. Um, but I still admired her. So that was something I had early on. But like Zeal, I went to college. I took a few twists and turns. I majored in English because I still, you know, I wanted to use that somehow in the future uh, to write. I, then I, go, I went on and got an advanced degree in theater arts. Hmm. See, we're very smart. Oh, Why? Wow. Why theater arts? Well, because, you know. It seems like you were going through the path of a journalist. <laughs> but you know what? Arts. It's like you said at the beginning, you know, arts are all connected. Right. I believe. And yeah. I, I, happen, okay. I happen to agree with you because we have camera people here, mm -hmm. people in the control booth, yeah. stage hands, stage managers. They play the piano. We sure. have Monty plays the piano. I do piano. that too. We have people who sing. We have, I do that uh, too. We have good artists. We have a gentleman who is in the, who is in, uh, in the mail room yeah. who's a great artist. I like his artwork, you know? Yeah. I think he's fantastic. I think it's all the same sort of energy. I and I did the, yeah. I play piano, I sing. And you feed off of it. I dance. So I had this idea I was going to be an actor. But then I realized after my graduate degree, L.A. didn't need another actor. <laughs> and, and, it yeah. the, and, and it required a, a real... Scott, this girl has about 500,000 and only about 5% are ever working full time. And maybe amongst all the arts, it's something you really, truly have to be possessed to do. Because right. I admire people who commit to it, but it is, a true, it is truly commitment. Um, and a great risk, and I just kind of thought that I would be better off writing. I kind of went back to my original idea of writing, but I still didn't know what to do. I had a liberal arts degree, and I was sort of, I was teaching, I was sort of wandering. Fortunately for me, I met a mentor, a good friend of mine, Ed Boyer, who wrote for the LA Times for many years, started his own magazine, and that's when he pulled me to journalism. I had not thought of journalism. I just wanted to be Phyllis Wheatley, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but he told an me... Unemployed an unemployed <laughs> poet, right? An unemployed, <laughs> but I'd be a poet. So I, I didn't, never occurred to me really to be a journalist, but uh, this friend of mine, Ed, was starting his own small paper, and he recruited me to write for it. He recognized my talent, and I said, but I'm not a journalist, and he said, I can teach you. He said, it's a way to make a living as a writer. You can still be creative, but it'll, you know, it's a way that you can actually have a job as a writer. So Actually make a living. Actually make Doing a living. something that you enjoy. So for five years, uh, I worked on the small paper. It's called Accent LA. It was circulated around Los Angeles. It was a black, it was a, a monthly magazine that, that covered a lot of um, issues in the African-American community, arts, culture, 
Um, we were pretty, we were pretty um, groundbreaking. We didn't realize at the time. I mean, it was like three people, sit, you know, renting an apartment, putting out a paper. Very small staff, almost no staff. But I learned how to be a journalist, how to write on deadline, how to say, tell an entire story in 500 words or less. So in 92, when, you know, this is the fifth year of our paper, what happened in L.A.? Civil unrest. Right. Suddenly the L.A. Times and many other papers realized they didn't cover the city very well. And that, <laughs> and that perhaps they needed to expand the coverage and they needed more, more grassroots voices. So fortunately for me, I was, I was taking, you know, the Times took me on in this new section they started right. that is now defunct. Right. But anyway, um, so then I had a real job at a newspaper as a reporter. And I was just really thrilled because I just never expected to end up there. Well, hold on to that thought because I know you're, we're traversing to another job from there and then all the way back to the LA Times, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go to a break. We'll be back right after this message. Don't run away, folks. I, wow, what a, what a world that they had in between the experiences. And I think young people who are watching the program and young adults were saying, you know what? I can do that. If she can do it, I can do it. Let's get back to now. You worked at the LA Times. Mm -hmm the riots, then what happened? Yeah, well, that's funny. That's where I started out. That was my first real job. It was a section called City Times, and I got to cover um, the, the South L.A. and the Crenshaw area, and I thought I was... And then I started kind of combining my, my writing ambition with kind of with, um, with my political maturity. I, I, I looked around, saw a lot of things wrong that I wanted to write about. So, so I, guess, I guess in that sense I became a journalist. Um, and uh, that's what I've been doing ever since, ever since 92. And in between, um, I freelance for a lot of people. I worked for nine years for the LA Weekly. Just left there uh, last month. But, th but th there is a difference between a journalist uh, a and a columnist, right? Oh, a, 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 yes. a reporter and a columnist. Uh, yeah, well, now, so, of course, I mean, the lines are very blurred, uh, unfortunately. It, it, it better not be. No, well, I mean, you know, I'm an opinion columnist. Right, so so right. It's, it's people recognize that what I write right. is my opinion. Although, right. even opinion is based in fact. You right. can't just, right. you know, uh, e an opinion of what? You know, you have to get that right. But it's so your opinion. It is my opinion. As opposed to if you were a reporter reporting on a story, right. you cannot give opinions, can you? No, you can not not blatantly. But I've come I've come to understand that there's no such thing as objectivity, really. That everyone, whether it's a reporter or, you know, even even you you don't hear the reporter's they bring their voice. Experiences. Yeah, it, just by virtue, of, their by voice virtue of what you say, what you in. don't say, right. kind of there's always a slant. There's oh, always I, I, there's I, always I, a tone. Hey, you know? I tell people that. Oh, yeah. In terms of journalism. You can still what, be a... what you do not see is journalism. Absolutely. So what you don't, they don't want, if they don't want to show a picture mm -hmm. that's very important mm -hmm. from, a, from an opinion perspective, if they don't show it, then you're making a decision. Uh, if very you true. Leave, if you leave a, a phrase out, a sentence out, or even a person that you quoted, yeah. you leave them out, that's an opinion as far as I'm concerned. Oh, absolutely. Let's get back to you, my friend Zill. You said that when you went to Howard, uh, you changed your, your, your art form. You were into the Europe type stuff prior to that, <clears throat> and writers were beneficial to you. Well, you asked me earlier um, what artists did I identify with when I was young and when I was making art when I was a child, basically, or during my childhood. And I don't remember any black images of art when I was a kid because most of the art classes that I was learning, even if I had instructors who were were black, they were still teaching Eurocentric in a Eurocentric way. They were teaching Impressionism, Renaissance artwork, I mean basically art that was by whites. And <clears throat> actually um, literature and art for me were two things that always kind of went together. I read books and it, it fed my imagination and I created artwork out of that. Sometimes like in classes we would write stories and illustrate them. And so for me, the two were almost always connected. I remember the first time I saw an image of a black person on a book cover, and I read voraciously when I was a kid. I mean, I would go to the library three and four times a week by myself, you know, and walk there across my small town and come back with a stack of books and go back the next day to check out more. Wow. And the first time I saw a book with a, I mean, a book with a black person on the cover, it was the color purple. And the two old, nice white ladies at the library called my grandmother to ask her if I could check out the book, and I was 10 years old. <laughs> Hey, well, you brought you brought some of your you brought some of your images with you. Let's take a look. Let's take a look what you what you've been doing on your own here. Let's take a look at the first one. Uh, this one is called um, Special Pink Spot, and it is um, <coughs> a painting, a mixed media painting based on sketches that I did at the Greenway Court Theater Poetry Slam that happens on Tuesday nights here around Fairfax and Melrose. And the, and the 
folks on the corners of the painting, who are they? Uh, inside the painting, it's just the audience members. So there are drummers, there are, you know, audience members. And actually, with text, I identify some of the audience members, and they're all different types of writers. Mm -hmm. So journalists, novelists, poets, um, rappers, um, you know, judges, whatever they are, the DJ, um, yeah. And right. the person, uh, okay, this the next one is called um, Double Consciousness. And this is actually based on a vignette from a play by George C. Wolfe called The Colored Museum. Again, you can see how art is very much for me connected to literature in some way. Mm -hmm. Spoken word here, a play. Um, the woman, okay, and this- Go ahead, go ahead. keep talking about it. Go back to that, please. Well, the woman what? Um, the woman is, has two wigs in her hand, and that represents double consciousness in a way. She's in a conversation with, you know, which wig she should wear. So basically the aesthetics of beauty in this particular country right. for black women. Next. Um, the next one is called Ode to Black Panther Women. Uh, this is an oil painting. Um, the Black Panthers were very influential for me when I was young and still are to some extent. I guess they were like my idols. <laughs> um, there was... What are the green, are those green <clears throat> mats? What are they? Um, those are diamond shapes that represent morning ground. They're grass. And there are small blue women, which represent the mourners um, of the, the Panther women who have passed away or died in the struggle. And then there are still women alive who are Panthers. And then there are also kind of like mythological creatures who, um, who are a representation, a kind of iconography of the women. And then on the left, the large image is kind of like, um, it's, it's a Panther that is the guardian of the Panthers, looking in both directions. And actually, I read later that Eshoo um, is often represented that way, and it was my intention to show the crossroads. And Eshoo in um, Yoruba often stands at the crossroads in African artwork, so. Next. The next one is called Piccaninnies at Recess. And this one is um, kind of a, a memoir of my childhood in a way. And um, in the background, you see the girls on the swing. And then in the, for, in the foreground, there are three young African-American girls, actually one with book, a book. <laughs> and there's text, small text, that is written into the painting that is free verse. Um, okay. The next yeah, one. We have one more left, I think. This one, is, um, this one is called Saturday Morning Ironing Begins. And this one is directly autobiographical. Um, on Saturday, sometimes my mom would ask um, a woman who sat on the porch and smoked cigarettes every day, who's since passed away of breast cancer, um, if she would help her with the ironing, which was a, a big problem for us because we had an extended family. You can see the ironing in the corner. And so she, Ellen, Miss Ellen would knock out the ironing in two hours, chain smoking, with all the clothes perfectly starched, where it would take my mom three days to do the same amount of mm -hmm. ironing. So. And my mother was a domestic, so she used to bring clothes mm -hmm. in. Uh, when she didn't get enough work uh, as a domestic, she used to bring uh, other, people's uh, other people's clothes in so she can iron, so she to help my dad out. Uh, Eric, let's, let's talk about your role at the LA Times. And, difference between a columnist and a and a reporter mm -hmm. uh, when you signed a contract with the LA Times what did they say this is what we want you to do or you did you tell them this <laughs> well, is what I would like to do well it's ironic ironically uh, they told me they wanted me to do what I do with the LA Weekly mm -hmm. and the LA Weekly as you know is a much more opinionated paper yes it's a it's a paper um, that freely mixes opinion and, well I find and it very I, th I find the LA Weekly very stimulating mm -hmm. no pictures and you have to actually read yeah, <laughs> there are some pictures, yeah, but we've lost few. our photo budget yeah, right, right. <laughs> last few years. But um, so I, I, I was used to sort of, I've always done a blend of, not always, but I've, I, I've, done, I've done a lot of essays. I, like for the weekly, I did a lot of features that, that, in which I was very present in those stories. Mm -hmm. it, it almost read like... First person? Uh, sometimes, which they encourage. So I was frankly surprised to get a call from the LA Times this time. Because remember the first time in 92, I was sort of a cub reporter reporting things that actually happened, you know, like just kind of straight news reporting, which is very valuable f actually for a creative writer, as it turns out. But I was not looking to go to the LA Times, and they called me, and they said they wanted that voice and that sensibility in the LA Times. So it's interesting how, and we're having a lot of, there's a lot of mixing now. The voice being covering the African-American community? Yeah. Or the community at large, uh, and, and the African-American community uh, is part of that? That's, I did, you know, um, they were looking for like personalities which is, you know, um, that's kind of the way that media's been going. In other words, you want readers to talk back to you. 
Well, I, I don't necessarily. I guess they do. <laughs> no, but do, do you understand what I'm saying? But, well, you, uh, uh, well you, you know, you want a reaction. Right. Hold on to that. We have to go to a break. Let's go to a break. Okay. We'll be back with our guests right after this message. Time. chosen a prescription drug plan yet? Well, we have been comparing. You should look into a health plan that gives you... Uh, comprehensive medical care on top of the prescription drug coverage. Last year, Frank had me sign up with his plan. Secure Horizons Medicare Advantage plan. Without it, my heart bypass surgery would have been very expensive. Charlie and Frank chose a Secure Horizons Medicare Advantage prescription drug plan. In addition to brand name and generic prescription drugs, they're covered for doctor visits, hospital stays, and more. Frank's give me some pretty crazy advice, but I took him up on Secure Horizon. Yep. It more than made up for the time you told me to take out Norma from Unit 5. <laughs> Secure Horizons provides prescription drug coverage plus comprehensive medical care with no deductibles and low co-payments. So which one of these prescription drug plans is the best choice? Here we go again. Yep. To get some advice, call Secure Horizons right now. We'll also send you a free information kit. If you want more information about our interesting guests and about Black History Month, all you have to do is check our website, ktla.com slash paysetters. And all the shows that we've aired in the past, you can find out information about that. And also, for the month of February and March and April, all the community calendar events, you can find that in our website. If you want more information about the International Black Writers and Artists of Los Angeles, there's the hotline number, 323-964-3721. Now, you brought a book with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's show the book, and then I want you to talk about it, okay? Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, this is Griot's Beneath the Baobab. Uh, you better explain to, uh, to the audience what Griot's means. Well, Griot's is, um, and, and it, m m me and my co-editor worked out this title. Um, Griot is a, is a West African word for storyteller. Right. Someone who passes on stories from, you know, one generation to the next, mm -hmm. an oral, an oral uh, tradition. And baobab is uh, a tree that grows in Africa, a very big tree with a very thick trunk. Right. It has special significance. Um, as you 